The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I did it, guys! I did it! I got ninth place in the DFS contest yesterday. That means that I placed top ten win money. I did it. I did it, guys. I won thirty dollars. That doesn't sound like. I mean, that's actually not insignificant. And the best part was, I lost terribly. All the times we had a 50-person room, and then I came through. Baby, I came through when we expanded the room size. So the prizes went up thanks to DraftKings and thanks to the 60-something, I think, was the final total people in the room yesterday for participating. This is, by the way, the perfect time to get in on the contests because the prizes remain the same regardless of whether or not we have 40 people in the room or 100. And we're not, I, I mean, next week we might have 40 with, you know, day after Christmas stuff. I don't know. But in general, in the heat of the NBA moment, as it were, on the day-to-day, it's been going up every week. The number of people in the DFS contest has gone up every week. Obviously, we maxed out at 50 for a few weeks there, but the room filled earlier every time. So by that account, I'm saying it went up every week. So DraftKings gave us a bigger room, doubled the prize pool, but we don't have to hit the 100 mark in order for the prizes to pay out. DraftKings actually probably loses a couple of bucks on our contest until we actually max out the room. So if you're looking for an opportunity, this is it. This is your best chance because right now, the payout is bigger than the pay-in. There were uh, 60-something people in the room yesterday that all paid $3 a piece to get into the competition. So let's round up and call it about $200 went into the room. $300 got paid out by HoopBall and DraftKings. So there's extra money on the line until you max out the room. Once you get to 100 people in, then the prize money matches the room money. So this is a great time to be in the DFS contest. I hope many of you will join us next week, uh, assuming there is one. Again, day after Christmas, so it'll be the 26th. And we'll obviously alert you about it here on the podcast. If you'd like to get on the mailing list, because I know next week is sort of a weird one. Maybe some of you are not going to be at work and on Twitter all day or whatever it is that you do that allows you to be on Twitter all day. Uh, Let me know, at Dan Bespris, I'll get you on our mailing list for the DFS contest. I'm just full of piss and vinegar today, though, man. I... I won 30 bucks in the DFS contest, revenge angles in the sports betting side of things. You know, we've added that to the podcast a little bit here lately. Revenge angles yesterday, and there were seven revenge games on the card last night. Seven of them. The Knicks were on revenge against the Sixers. The Spurs were on revenge against Orlando. Phoenix was on revenge against Boston. Uh, Houston was on revenge against Washington. Utah was on revenge against Golden State. Oklahoma City was on revenge against Sacramento. Double, by the way, revenge against Sacramento. And Portland was on revenge against Memphis. Six and one against the spread in those games. The only loss, the New York Knicks, who actually played pretty well. That game was 76-73 halfway through the third quarter, and then it all came apart. Knicks ended up losing by 22, so that one ended up being a pretty easy cover for Philly. But overall, I mean, that is nuts. There were medium-sized favorites that covered. Portland was a six-point favorite. They ended up winning by seven, although they were up 14 with two minutes to go, and Memphis scored the final seven points of that ballgame, so looked tighter than it was. Oklahoma City covered a five-point spread on the road. Uh, San Antonio covered a three-point spread on the road. Phoenix was an 11.5-point underdog in Boston and won that game outright by eight. They covered by 20 points. Utah, home underdog by a little bit, covered against Golden State and won it outright, 108-103. What a time, man. What a time. So I will preface and we'll talk. There, there is a revenge game on the card tonight, which is amazing because there's only two games happening this evening. Uh, a point I want to stress is it's not going to go 6-1 and one long term. There's no angle in the NBA that's going to go 6 and 1. 6 out of 7 is 86%. Nothing hits 86%. Nothing. Meaning by the law of averages, this is going to have to come down. 
There are a couple ways that that percentage could come down. It could come down in a precipitous drop, like losing the next three in a row, so that it ends up going six out of ten or something like that. Or it could be a much more subtle drop where maybe you actually win, like, let's say six out of the next 11 but by going six and five on top of six and one then you're 12 and six and so yes still obviously a very good percentage at 67 percent but it's coming down from 86 percent so it could just go 50 50 for the next month and it would still be a winning proposition because of yesterday i don't know that's the point i want to stress in all of this i don't know what the future holds This is an angle that I feel like is underutilized because two reasons. Number one, and then we're going to get into the fantasy stuff, but I wanted to preface with some sports betting things because yesterday was such an interesting day. Six and one on revenge angles. Just blindfolded, pick the revenge games, you went six and one. Two reasons here why this is an interesting angle and why we're tracking it. Don't bet it big, guys, by the way. This is not like a proven thing over 10 years. This is something we're working on. Reason number one, those people in the know have written off revenge angles because the playoffs make them seem stupid. And they are in that context. There was, uh, for many years, a theory known as the zigzag theory, meaning that in the playoffs, you waited to see what happened in game one, and you faded it in game two, and basically bounced back and forth in a zigzag. So, you know, if Golden State was a six-point favorite in game one, and they won by 15, then you, in game two, take the underdog. The assumption is that the team that loses is going to make the adjustments and play and perform better in game two. Whereas the team that won feels like they can sit on what they did already, do it again, and win again. And so the games tend to be to swing a little bit. Well, the problem in the playoffs is that the lines often reflect that. It's cooked in. The line you get in Game 2 is built in with the notion that a lot of people are going to fade what they saw in Game 1. That has steered people away from reacting to games in that manner. During the regular season, that phenomenon still exists, but there are so many games over so many days, and the NBA season, man, it's not baseball, but it's a slog. People have trouble keeping track of this stuff. To find out if somebody's on a revenge game, you got to look at that team's whole schedule, find out if they've played the particular team already, how it went, look up you know, the box score, uh, what type of a game was it? You know, was it a last-second buzzer beater? Was it a boring game? All these little things go into it. Who was out, perhaps? You know, maybe there was a superstar out in a previous matchup, right? Like Toronto Golden State played twice recently, almost back-to-back, just a couple games apart. Steph Curry was out in Game 1 of that series, and Kawhi Leonard, I believe, or was it Kyle Lowry? One of those two guys was out in the second game of that one, so it totally changes the phenomenon. The Warriors lost in Toronto, but they lost without their best player. Toronto comes in, they sit their best player, and so the Warriors are like, ah, whatever, and then they got whomped. All these little things play a role. It's why I was actually afraid of that Spurs revenge line yesterday, because Nick Vucevic was out for Orlando. Turns out, by the way, he is worth more than the three points that the line shifted. He's apparently their entire team. He's like Steph, basically, for the Warriors. It's a silly comparison, but he is kind of the most important thing on the magic. Point of, uh, that was reason number one. Reason number one is that we've convinced ourselves that revenge doesn't exist during the regular season, but it does. Reason number two uh, was the fact that it's difficult to locate, that you have to do some extra work where people get caught up in the, the little stuff and you actually have to be a little bit more on a macro scale, right? You pull out from whatever you're looking at you pull away you pull the camera back and you say okay well let's forget about individual matchups for a minute let's forget about how these two teams are playing at this exact moment what is what do we know 
you know, in yesterday's games, there were some some of these revenge angles. You look at them, you're like, I don't understand how that could have worked at all. Utah was looking horrible. And they came home and beat the Warriors by five. Sacramento, outside of that game in Minnesota, had actually been looking really good, and they just got steam-trained by Oklahoma City. You know, Philly coming home off a terrible game. They beat the crap out of New York. In a, in a micro sense, some of this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense, but in a macro sense, it does. One, There were a couple of quotes that came out from yesterday's games that made me think we do have a little something that we're building on here. Quote was, uh, number one was from Kelly Oubre, believe it or not, who was talking about how he, who had just played the Celtics, by the way, as a member of the Washington Wizards, remembered all of their sets. That was his. That was the way he said it. He's like, I still remember all of their action. So these guys remember when they play these teams. And you know damn well that Boston went into that game with Phoenix thinking, this is going to be simple. Let's just do our usual stuff. We'll be fine. Phoenix remembered playing Boston. Kelly Oubre remembered playing Boston. Portland remembered Memphis. All of these little things go into it. Oklahoma City, uh, double revenge against Sacramento. They played great defense in that game yesterday. There were some really clever switches for Oklahoma City. Good communication on defense. Uh, the other quote, and I'm trying to remember who said it. I think, I think it came actually from a beat writer for the Sacramento Kings who was talking about how the Thunder got there avenged their losses to the Kings earlier in the year. So the people that are really tight with the team, they are aware of this stuff. The beat writers, the reporters, they know. They hear about it. Remember we talked about Greg Popovich a couple weeks ago saying he hated playing the same team two times in a row. He said it felt like the playoffs. Yeah, well, teams don't like to lose to the same guys two times in a row. So we're going to keep watching this stuff. Uh, and we'll talk about the game that's on the docket tonight. Apologize. I, I mean, I'm not really going to apologize for taking a bunch of time to talk about it at the beginning of the show. You guys always say I talk about BS, but this is important stuff. This is money-making stuff. Big Wednesday to cover. We're going to talk to Christian Villery, the host of the Hoopball Sacramento Kings podcast. Get a little bit of a deep dive on those Kings. Find out uh, what do we expect from this team moving forward. And then, of course, we'll profile a very short Thursday evening car, just two games coming up tonight, which you want to talk about getting a break. That is your break. Too much of this back and forth, by the way, giant card, tiny card stuff these days. I want a week where it's like seven games every single night. That's the stuff I like. I don't want to wait until five o'clock for a game to start. I don't know how you East Coasters do it. You don't have a game until eight o'clock tonight? Brutal. That's the worst. It's good to be out here. I'd rather be in Hawaii. Game started one in the afternoon down there. Anywho, uh, I don't even know if I introduced the show. This is Fantasy NBA Today, also some sports betting. I'm Dan Bespris, at Dan Bespris on Twitter. Give me a follow. Uh, again, you can shoot a note at me if you want to get on that DFS mailing list. If you have any questions about anything, you know where to find me. This is a hoop ball presentation. Hoop-ball.com is the website. Go there. Check it out. At Hoop Ball Fantasy on Twitter, at Hoop Ball Tweets. And, of course, all podcasts through the HoopBall Network, are brought to you by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. HawaiianIsles.com is the website. Search for Hawaiian Isles on Amazon if you want to check them out. H.I. Kona Coffee. Give them a follow. Talk to them on Twitter. As we said before, they are fantasy junkies. All they want to do is talk to you about fantasy sports, which is pretty sweet, and then you'll get to know them, and you'll be like, damn, I should probably drink some of this coffee. And you should. I was talking, by the way, with the number two guy in last week's DFS contest. His name is Mike. Uh, and he said he actually, his dog is named Kona. Figure I should then mention my mother's dog is named Kona, which I believe just means black. Uh, and yes, it, it does happen to be a black dog that my mother owns. Um, but regardless, Kona coffee. That's what you should be getting. HawaiianIsles.com. 12 games yesterday. This is going to be one of those days where we actually need to take a moment and make sure that we are only profiling the things that are of the utmost importance. Which, by the way, for a 12-game card, there wasn't a lot of fantasy stuff to look at, which seems crazy and almost impossible, but it was true. Cleveland? Nothing. Charlotte? Okay, fine. Charlotte 
one thing, and that one thing is that Marvin Williams played 38 minutes, 18 points, 10 rebounds, 2 assists, a block, 2 three-pointers, 0 turnovers. Stellar line from old man Marv. I think that I want to try to name the 30-minute threshold the Marvin Thad line, like a, like, like a Mason Dixon line kind of thing, where it's, it's the cutoff between something not good below the line and something very good below it, but I feel like that's maybe not a great comparison to make. So uh, either way, for those of you that are listening for the first time today, I have many old men in the NBA that I like to put on my fantasy teams. They're great nine-category guys. They generally don't turn the ball over. They do a few things pretty well. They don't do anything horribly. And so they're just these great, like, top 90, top 80, top 100 type guys that perfectly round out your fantasy team in nine category leagues. Almost all of those guys need to hit the 30 minute threshold to be relevant because they're not out there handling the basketball. They're not out there chewing up usage rate. They're on the floor and the stats are just going to slowly trickle into their bucket. That's why the turnovers are so low. Marvin Williams, Thad Young, Danny Green, P.J. Tucker, but I mentioned uh, yesterday, has his own line. His is closer to like 34 minutes. I'm sure there's a handful of other guys out there that I'm forgetting on this one. But Marvin is well above the line lately. And I honestly, I feel like people have turned it into a little bit of a joke how much I like Marvin Williams. And fine, it's funny. You guys, you know, Dan loves the old men of the NBA. But over the last month... Marvin Williams in 13 games is number 53 in 9-cat. That's not a joke. That's a fifth round value. Middle of the fifth round, not even late fifth round. 47% shooting, 2.5 three-pointers, 11.5 points, 7 rebounds, a steal, an assist, half a block, and .3 turnovers per game. That's a big deal, by the way. To have one guy on your team putting up solid stats in field goal percent, three-pointers, rebounds, some defensive stats, and doing it without adding any turnovers to your team, that's for a month, by the way. Marvin Williams' last turnover in an NBA game came on December 7th. Not kidding. He had one terrible game in there where LeBron just rolled him, the whole team, Charlotte. I mean, you... You pull out that ball game, and he's been on a vicious tear. Last two weeks, he's number 43. Last week, he's number 38. Last seven days. And, you know, some of that unsustainable. He's shooting 58% over the last week. But remember when we looked at him a week ago and said, hey, he's been shooting 38% for the last two weeks. If that ever comes up to his 43% mark, then we're really talking about a guy. Well, guess what? It's coming up. So I honestly don't know, and he's owned in every league that I'm in. His ownership is up to 42%. But like three weeks ago, when we were all telling you to watch Marvin Williams and maybe pick him up and use him, and he was at like 8% owned, yeah, I hope you jumped on that. I have a lot of Marvin, and I know it's funny because he's one of the Dan Bespris old man squad guys. Nobody believes in poor Marvin. Nobody remembers the two months, two years ago, where he was a top 50 guy. He legitimately, and now Dwight Howard is gone. That was one of the big pieces I was arguing this offseason because he can get his rebounds again. He can get back up from five rebounds to six and a half because there's no Dwight. And when he's out there for 30 minutes or more, he's generally grabbing seven or more rebounds. Look at his box score log. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of his last 11 games, I think. You pull out the injured game, seven of the last 11 games he's played more than 30 minutes. In those games, 13, 8, 11, 10, 10, 5, and 10. And in the five-rebound game, he just happened to have 20 points and four three-pointers. He also has a steal and a block in three of his last four games. Ta-da. Stop making it a joke, guys. Marvin Williams is here, and he's actually doing, like, legitimate stuff. For a month. That's not nothing. Anyway, 
Uh, the Knicks, I think the only fantasy note here is that we got exactly what we expected, which was a lot of points out of Kevin Knox and almost nothing else. Some bad percentages for Emmanuel Moutier with some points, rebounds, and assists. And then the usual guys, Noah Vonley, Ennis Canner, Tim Hardaway Jr., all were decent. I only wonder, and I know uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., we got the news yesterday, he's playing through plantar fasciitis, so he might be relegated more to this 28-minute zone instead of like 36 if that keeps him on the floor, then frankly, I'm fine with it. That's sort of my end game with that one. Nothing of note on the Philadelphia side with Butler back. They're basically just four guys, Butler, Simmons, Embiid, and J.J. Redick for the most part. Uh, you're not trusting the other guys. I know Landry Shamet had 17 points yesterday and, you know, T.J. McConnell, Mike Mascala, all these guys we were sort of watching. None of them is really going to be out there doing enough to be relevant. San Antonio, Orlando, you can largely throw this game out as a 39-point blowout. Spurs shot 65% for the game, so it was never really that close. Mo Bamba filling in for Nick Vucevic, who was out for personal reasons, had a nice fill-in game, but that's all it'll be. And then Jonathan Isaac, who we're always watching, I mean, heaven forbid they actually let him get involved on offense every once in a while. He had 10-5 and five with an assist, two three-pointers, no steals or blocks. I mean, the Spurs just ran him. I don't know. I'm I'm caught in between. I keep wanting to throw Isaac into the mix, and then I keep regretting it when I do. I think we kind of have to see him play well for like three games in a row before you can really deploy him. Phoenix was a team we were watching very closely yesterday. This was one of the interesting ones. This is one we wanted to laser in on a little bit to find out who was actually going to play minutes. This looks like the lineup that they're going to trot out there most nights, which is DeAndre Ayton, for anywhere from 25 to 32 minutes, and he was a beast, so he was at the top end of that yesterday. With 23 and 18, you can understand why. Missed a few defensive assignments, but damn, when, when you're putting up numbers on that percentage and the way he was able to rebound better than anyone else, once Aaron Baines went out, he just had his way. Uh, he deserves the minutes. And I want to complain about Rashawn Holmes not playing more, but Aiton actually outplayed him in yesterday's game. I'm not worried, though. Rashawn Holmes... In 16 to 22 minutes a game is a standard league guy. TJ Warren obviously is a must-use guy. Um, I mean, he's solid, got off to a really slow start, and then ended up having an okay game. Devin Booker, likewise, slow start, okay game, too many turnovers. And then we get to the other guys, right? We've got the four that are in, Aiton, Warren, Booker, Holmes. The questions we had about the Suns revolved around two things. How would the point guard minutes go, and how would the small forward minutes go? The answer on the point guard minute side is that Jamal Crawford and DeAnthony Melton split about 32 of the 48 point guard minutes, and the other 16 were played by Devin Booker. Booker was out there for 37 minutes last night, and for about 16 of them, he was the point guard. It, de facto. Okay, de facto point guard, because he was out there with a bunch of other small forwards and shooting guards, so any one of them you could potentially call the point guard. I think he was the shortest, though. This is notable because Josh Jackson ended up playing 27 and a half minutes, Mikael Bridges played 33 minutes, and Kelly Oubre played 26 minutes in his debut. I'm out on the point guards. I said that a couple days ago. I'm sticking by it. I don't think there's enough there. There's not enough minutes or opportunity for either of those guys, Melton or Crawford, to do anything while Booker is healthy. The small forward situation is one that we were patrolling a little bit more closely. Kelly Oubre, I think, was a guy I said you could take a flyer on and hope that he could stick in nine category. And, you know, with what we saw yesterday, you had the third highest usage rate on the team behind Booker and Warren, pretty much right in line with DeAndre Ayton. And if he can actually sustain a 20-plus usage rate then he's absolutely worth using. He's not a great shooter. I don't think he ever will be. He shot four for 12 yesterday. A lot of his shots come from downtown. But, you know, two blocks, a steal, two three-pointers, six rebounds, that's nothing to sneeze at. And then with Bridges, who's a zero usage kind of guy, he had the lowest on the team at eight, knocked down three three-pointers, had seven rebounds and a steal. So he's actually still kind of in the mix as well. 
As it turned out, by the way, Josh Jackson had an okay game because he made five out of eight shots and didn't have to take a free throw. But overall, he's going to be a little bit higher usage than you saw yesterday, and he's going to kill you in nine category leagues while still remaining, it seems, somewhat usable in points leagues. So the breakdown for me as it stands right now, and this could obviously change after their next ball game. The four main guys are obviously you start those dudes. The other dudes are drops for Melton and Crawford. Ubre is a hold in nine cat. Bridges is a watch list in nine cat. And Jackson is a hold in points leagues and a drop everywhere else. On the Celtic side, Aaron Baines broke his hand. He's out for a month. We don't know what the heck's going on with Al Horford. So if you want to stream Robert Williams for a game or two, I'm okay with it. Go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might get, it might only be two games. I honestly don't know when Al Horford is coming back. I'm super confused at what his actual status is. Uh, so if you want to trot Williams out there and hope that he blocks seven shots in two games, I'm fine with it. You got to find the right drop, though. It's got to be somebody that you don't intend on using long term. Who's the drop? Who is the drop? Mm -mm -mm. Tough to say. But, I mean, that's a short-term stream. You're hoping that Al Horford is back by the end of the week, next week. Nothing else really of note in this ballgame. Marcus Smart generally plays much better when there's a little bit of a thinning of the herd, and, uh, and Marcus Morris was out in this game. And Jalen Brown's been playing kind of poorly. Uh, Smart, in general, by the way, worth using because his steals numbers are crazy right now. Indiana, Toronto. I don't want to spend much time on this one. Uh, you know, Darren Carlson had a bunch of turnovers against a very good Toronto defense. There's just not much there. Thad Young was over the 30 minute mark, so he was solid. Miles Turner's playing really well lately. Toronto side, you got Lowry out another couple of games. Ibaka's out. We don't know for how long. Valanchunas out for another three weeks. So, I mean, you know, you're not going to stream Greg Monroe, right? You shouldn't. I guess you could stream Fred Van Fleet while Lowry's out. He's not generally going to shoot 24% on 17 shots. He's a streamable guy. These, this, is, this is the thing. That's why I was saying that yesterday's card was sort of weird because it was almost all stream stuff. There wasn't a lot of large changes taking place. I mean, generally, Freddie Van Vliet is going to be a lot better than this. And this was actually not that terrible of a line if you wipe out the terrible shooting. Anyway, more stream stuff. Washington, Houston. Trevor Reza played 36 minutes again. He looks ready to roll for the Wizards. Sadly, the rest of the team doesn't. Jeff Green, no. Sadoransky, no. Warned you guys about that usage rate thing. Thomas Sadoransky had one of the lowest usage rates of any player yesterday on any team. He played 22 minutes and he got up three shots. That's pretty bad. Usage rate of six. Oopsies. Uh, Sam Decker, no. So it's John Wall, Bradley Beal, Trevor Ariza. Otto Porter when he gets back? Probably. We'll see how that changes things, too. Wanted to keep one eye on New Orleans to see if anybody could really step up with Peyton Miritich and Randall all out. And the answer is not really. Darius Miller had 20 points. Is that something you're actually going to trust? Going? I mean, he did play 36 minutes. He made six three-pointers. It's Again, you're looking at a potential streaming option here. That's just not that fun for me. Streaming's boring. If you can find one that you really trust, though, and squeeze a couple games out of it, I suppose it's worth it, especially in a games cap format. We throw a guy in there who's going to be a top 50 dude for two games. It's not nothing. You know, it's better than playing a top 100 guy for those two games. You just sit down one of your end-to-bench players, bring in the stream guy, and call it a day. Reggie Bullock. Seven three-pointers in Detroit's overtime win. This might be that apex we were talking about. Remember, we mentioned uh, two days ago that he goes through these crazy hot streaks, and he's hit 16 three-pointers in his last three games. That's not going to keep up, right? Guys just don't change like that overnight. He's not going to take 21 shots almost ever. 
He's generally going to be in that 9 to 12 shots per game range, and he is going to hit two and change three-pointers a night. He's useful for one particular statistical category. I guarantee you the second you throw him into your lineup, he's going to crap the bed. Minnesota side uh, are always watching the Taj versus Dario Saric situation, and Dario won this one because Taj fouled out. Easy enough. That's like the the technical knockout version of who wins. Taj still got the start, still appears to be the guy in the driver's seat, and frankly, they play better when Taj is playing well. When he's on the floor, they are a better team. He fouled out, Cat fouled out, and at that point it seemed like Detroit was in the driver's seat, and they were. And they were. Blake Griffin had a big game, Reggie Jackson had a big game. Derrick Rose is going to go huge for as long as Jeff Teague is out. I have Rose in a few spots, so I'm hoping that is a long time, although it's probably not. Derrick had 33-7 and in yesterday's game. That's a whopper. Covington looks good again. Five three-pointers, a steal, and a block. Saric had a solid game, but I I wouldn't trust him. I mean, you have two other front court guys foul out for him to really carve out a role. That's a tough spot to exist in. We were watching Rondé Hollis Jefferson, and he was terrible. So thank goodness for that. I feel a little bit better. He was starting to play a tiny bit better. I still don't trust him. It's points, rebounds, and assists for Rondé, and that's just not enough for me. He's not doing it in steals, blocks, threes. Percentages aren't good. He didn't have any turnovers yesterday, so that's something. But no, I'm out. I am interested in Alan Crabb when he comes back. He was starting to play better. It seemed like he was finally kind of finding a niche, and then all of a sudden we're going to get word that Levert is like three weeks away. (laughs) That's not what I'm saying. Guys, he's not three weeks away. I'm just saying that at some point in the next couple weeks, you're going to get this news break that it's like, oh, Karis Levert's almost back, and then all of this watching these other dudes is going to be for naught. Zach Levine out for a couple more weeks. Uh, So Chris Dunn has reign of the house. Bobby Portis played 24 minutes, but apparently tweaked his ankle at some point during this game, so who knows what that means. Wendell Carter Jr. played 24 minutes. Robin Lopez uh, Lopez played 15. Uh, weird front court stuff going on in Chicago. I don't think I'm bailing on anybody just yet. You ought to see how this thing shakes out. I know there's this urge in the NBA to panic, but don't panic. Please, I beg of you. Let's hold on to Carter Jr., hold on to Portis, hold on to Markinen, the usual guys. Just wait for this thing to play itself out. Jay Crowder got 31 minutes against the fast-paced Warriors and had a nice ball game, so we'll keep one eye on him, but I'm not going to celebrate yet. Sacramento was without uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich and Marvin Bagley and still uh, Michelin man on peg legs. Nemanja Bialica couldn't quite pull through. I still think he's a good stream in this spot. He just He just got worked by Oklahoma City. Dude, how good is Paul George lately? Man alive. Russell Westbrook is drawing all the attention for the triple-double, but Paul George was way better than Russ in yesterday's game. Like, it wasn't close. It was George that stopped the Sacramento runs. It was George that played the insane defense. Westbrook got the steals. He was in the right place. Paul George was crazy good. I mean, they could both be good, I guess, but guys, I watched this game because I had money on it. (laughs) Paul George was incredible. Memphis and Portland, everything was right. Thank goodness. Slow-mo, big game. Marcus Gasol, solid game. Jaron Jackson Jr., solid game. Jermichael Green, not so solid game. This is kind of how we'd prefer it go, right? You want Gasol, you want JJJ, you want slow-mo. Jermichael Green was never supposed to be that guy, and he was taking minutes away. And in this one, everything just went right for a night. Let's hope that continues. Portland side, we were watching Mo Harkless, and he was quiet in this one. A lot of guys were, though. Memphis can do that to a final score. A very depressed number, 99-92, the final total on this one. Rarely do you see a game stay under 200 points these days, and this one wasn't close. Okay, it was close, but, you know, not that close. Damian Lillard, basically the only Portland Trailblazer to escape unscathed from a meeting with the Memphis Grizzlies last night. Uh, let's move on to the guest portion of the proceedings, which is good because we just talked about the Kings a moment ago and, uh, they've had more injuries since then. So, uh, we talked to Christian, uh, two days ago, Bogdan wasn't out yet. 
bear that in mind, and let's roll. Christian Villery. Oh, yes, indeed. The man, the myth, the host of the Hoopball Kings podcast. The call. This this is like when I get to do the the call is coming from inside the building thing. We're doing we're doing some incestuous crap on today's show. This is a Hoopball on Hoopball podcast. CV. What's up, my man? Uh, so pleased to be joining Dan Besbris. So so pleased that I've made it onto Fantasy NBA today. It's been a thrill of mine. That's right. To you make it uh, on the show. you sucked up long enough, and so I deemed you worthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys got to check it out if you haven't already. And I'm betting many of you have because uh, loyal hoop ballers, you tend to check out sort of the other stuff we've got going on over here. Uh, but Christian is the host of the Hoopball Sacramento Kings podcast. You can follow their Twitter feed at Hoopball Kings. Uh, hey, wait, did you change your Twitter handle? What's what's the most recent one? My Twitter handle, which has been that way for a while, is at my buddy Chris. That's right. That's right. I couldn't remember yeah. if you changed it to uh, something with your last name in it. It's my buddy Chris. That's what you is. Very He's- memorable. It associates me with being somebody's buddy I'm for all of it <laughs> nice tie-in to somebody who's on the team works in many different ways yeah did you have that twitter handle before they traded for buddy healed no oh after. well done i was simply i was simply trying to come up with something i could say it people would know what it was i wouldn't need to explain the spelling of anything in particular mm. i become kind of obsessed with names where you give it to somebody and they won't have to spend the rest of their life clarifying the name itself or how to spell it. Yeah, uh, you and I both suffer from that affliction to some degree. Villery is V-I-L-L-E-R-E. Bespris, as people have heard, B-E-S-B-R-I-S. I've been called, my wife actually got called Dr. Bieber week, uh, recently, which was a pretty exciting time for the both of us. Uh, but let's talk about your Kings, your Sacramento Kings. They are, I'll admit this, not terrible. That's got to be kind of exciting for you from on, on sort of, more of a macro level before we get into the you know the nitty gritty stuff like they're not bad you're 16 and 14 kings are playing well you're tied for the nine seed with the grizzlies this has to be i would think better than anybody's best expectation dan as somebody who's podcasting about the kings twice a week the fact that they are semi-decent dare i say it exciting is way helpful to the way i spend my time (laughs) because of course podcasting on the kings entails me actually watching the games. And when the games are entertaining, it certainly makes my job a whole heck of a lot easier. And there's more people excited to watch, talk, listen to content about the Kings, also making my job easier. Yeah, you know, doing a Lakers podcast, we we sort of have the the benefit of a team that's just going to be iconic all the time. Even when they're terrible, they're iconic for being terrible for a couple of years. Uh, Kings really do have to be good because Sacramento is not, I think, maybe a bigger city than people realize, but it's not that gigantic. So it's uh, it's pretty good that the Kings are in the news for at least some better reasons this year. Not all good. Not all good. There's still weird stuff floating around. But uh, from an on-court perspective, they've been very good on the road. Uh, Kings, I believe, are one of like six teams with a winning record both at home and away, which is pretty neat. And you throw out what was effectively uh, a brutal fatigue back-to-back game in Minnesota. They've been playing really well recently as well. Segwaying now into why that's been the case, Christian, what have you seen from the Kings that's allowed them to kind of come up out of a little like month long, uh, like the month point lull, and they seem to have hit kind of a new stride again, eliminating that tired game in Minnesota. It helps when Zach Randolph is not the anvil on defense that he was last year. Nemanja Bielica has been an amazing surprise. We were expecting, we I don't know what to be expecting, what we were expecting prior to the start of the season from him. Didn't know a lot about him, but clearly he's he's come in. He's been a facilitator on offense, excellent spot up shooter. He's shooting some absurd mark from beyond the arc, but. It's really hinged upon De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, to some degree Willie Cauley-Stein on the offensive end, taking a leap this year. And the primary person of those three being De'Aaron Fox. A lot has been talked about regarding his play this year, and for a good reason. He's playing at another level. He has taken it upon himself 
in closing moments of games to be the guy dictating what happens. He's shooting an amazingly good mark from beyond the arc. And his trademark, I'm going to run through five guys and dunk it in your face, is a nice coda to everything that he has done this season. As a Sacramento Kings fan, I think I speak for the kingdom at large. Funny, that's a that's a nice yeah. I like that. The I like yeah. The kingdom. The kingdom. The king's kingdom. The king's fan kingdom at large. He is playing extremely well, and we are extremely excited about it. So he's an easy one, and Buddy Heald is kind of an easy one too. Some of the other names on this team as we get into more of a fantasy perspective, are a little bit tougher to read. You mentioned Bielitsa. He's obviously in a nice window right now with Marvin Bagley shelved for a couple of weeks, but it seemed like it was trending the other way prior to Bagley's injury. Is that a situation over the course of the year where at some point Bielitsa potentially even moves into the second unit? Because I think he was still starting even though he was only playing like 20, 21 minutes a game, right? But this is something where I might be able to provide a little bit of, of fantasy help because there, there's a little bit more of a backstory to this. Bagley has been playing better, actually, with Bielitsa on the court. They haven't played a ton together, but the numbers kind of bear this out. Myself and the co-hosts on the Hoopball Sacramento Kings podcast, which you can follow, subscribe to on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Right. It's available for download there he and he you can find him on twitter at john cheerfully he contends that uh, bielitsa is the better fit for for bagley and bag and bielitsa to a large degree has been a great fit for just about any big you put out there on the court for the kings the drawback to to bielitsa is he is a bit of a a weak spot on defense and you saw on a monday night against the Timberwolves that Taj Gibson was going at him pretty hard. Assuming teams don't take advantage of that, it's really easy to keep him out on the floor, and it's easy to do that with Bagley. If we see Bagley playing more with guys who are capable on offense and who can spread things out a little bit more, give him some more space to work, give him the ability to work those offensive boards, which have been a strength of his game, I would. I, I know nothing about fantasy basketball, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense given that I'm doing a show for a fantasy basketball website. <laughs> but the little bit that I know about fantasy, I would be inclined to play him if I'm seeing a trend where he's playing more with Bielitsa. Hmm. If you see him playing more with traditional bigs, I'd be inclined to stay away from him. But that's not a terribly informed inclination, just what I would go off based upon what I've seen and, and what the numbers bear out so far. What about Willie Colley Stein? Is he locked into 30 ish minutes at the center spot or is there room for him to potentially get squeezed out a little bit? Yeager's Yeager's a barrel of surprises. <laughs> I so far this season, like right now I I'd be inclined to say yes, but part of me gets the feeling that Yeager's tingling to, to make some adjustments see what some other guys are capable of. If they keep winning, I would expect him to continue to get the 30 minutes per game regardless of what is happening with his play. If you see things start to go sideways with the Kings, I would be inclined to pick up a guy like Harry Giles. Scal is kind of the last guy on the depth chart for the Kings at the moment. If you see things going sideways, those minutes are probably going to go down. If they continue to play well, which is going to hinge to a good deal on him doing well, because when they were out to that hot start at the beginning of the season, he was extremely good in the restricted area. It seemed like an almost automatic two points when he was making a quick move in the post near the basket. Lately, that's been less so the case, Mm. but... If they're doing well, I would assume he will find that form once again and you'll still see him playing a a good bit here, like 30 minutes a game or something close to that uh, moving forward. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Bogdan. uh, Into the starting unit with Iman Shumpert getting intermittent rest days, seemingly more of like the, the power punch off the bench when Shumpert's starting. 
uh, is there any potential for his role to change moving forward? I mean, I, the way I, I ask these questions all in kind of a similar vein, because looking at the Kings, and again, skipping over that Minnesota game, but looking at their box score in Dallas uh, from the weekend, you had five starters that all played 32 minutes or more. Everything looked very simple there, but that's be. I get the feeling a lot of that was because Bagley and Shumpert were out. How, how does that situation play itself kind of moving forward because it does seem like they like Shumpert and what he brings on the court when he's healthy I would expect Bondanovich to I'm sorry I've actually been pronouncing his naming properly and there's a listener who's been getting on me about it it's Bogdan Bogdanovich and I actually, figured I think as much you it's pronounced just, it improperly yeah I, so. I gave him the Bogdan treatment uh yeah I, I I called him Bogdan and then it felt like it was too much work so then I dialed it back a little bit so we can call him bogey <laughs> I think I think Bogdan gives him a little more attitude yeah I think that's that's right Bogdan is a very soft ending to the name Bogdan Bogdanovich yeah he's been playing well it's been nice to have him back in the lineup because he was out for a little bit at the beginning of the season with a left knee injury coming back from arthroscopic surgery. The problem that he's had recently is shots been a little rickety. Happens. I, it's kind. I would expect it's a little bit like the slump you get when you're just getting adjusted to being back in the season. You have that initial jolt of energy from coming back and being involved in the game again. Then it goes into a little bit of a lull, mm. and I'm sure he's gonna he's on the other side coming back out of it. I'm hoping that happens sooner rather than later. Buddy, on the other hand, seems to be fully engaged with the season. He is at the top of his powers right now that everybody saw in, in the first quarter last night with when he scored 16 of the first 17 for the Kings. Bogdan's role is well, he had actually been put into backup point guard status for Dave Yeager recently when they had made a few changes. He was going to be the primary ball ha- ball handler behind De'Aaron Fox. That had worked pretty well. He was having a little bit of trouble adjusting to it, becoming a little bit of a black hole, but he's gotten away from that recently. And he is aggressive offensively. He's He's really playing very well. Yes, we could sit here and nitpick a little bit, that his shot's not going in as well as we would have hoped. But on the whole, playing very well. He's, he's been one of the Kings' better players this season. There's there's a lot to like. He's being aggressive defensively as well, maybe picking up some ticky-tack fouls here and there that you'd like to have him stay away from. Yet again, the Vlade Divac bringing in a player that I had no idea about three years ago, and we're all thrilled about it. I don't think we were going to be saying that very frequently four years ago, but here I sit, confounded and happy about it. Hmm. And then uh, on the Shumpert front, does he get dialed back at any point this year, or is it, you know, skips one of the two back-to-backs, and in the other one, he's going to play starters minutes? Shumpert has been extremely good. Like I, I, John explained to me fantasy a little bit a while ago that you're, you're looking for value in players that may not seem like high usage guys. Shumpert's the ideal three and D guy. Also, he's got some creativity to him with ball handling where he can get his own shot if needed. Three's been going down at a pretty good rate for him this year. He's playing insane defense. I think he initiated three. What what is the when they said an illegal screen? Illegal screen violations practically in a row on Friday night against the Golden State Warriors. It has been so nice to have his experience out there on the court defensively. It's it's really been helpful You're going from Zach Randolph kind of being an anvil to Shumpert being a value add for the Kings on that on that end of the court. It, it's been a breath of fresh air chemistry-wise. He's really helping the Kings. I expect him to continue getting a lot of minutes moving forward. A lot of this really hinges on how well the Kings do Moving forward, if they continue to win, I would expect to see things propel into the future in roughly the same trajectory we're on now. If they continue to lose, I think they will go to giving some of the younger players more minutes than, or at least the minutes we would have expected they they were going to get 
coming into this season if the Kings were going to go the development route. But with this unexpected winning that we're seeing, I would assume that they're going to try and lengthen that out as long as possible, try to be in this playoff race as long as they can and continue to give guys like Shumpert a good deal of minutes moving forward. Who are the uh, the development route? You mentioned that as the possible other path for this team. Are, are there guys that are playing small minutes right now we should keep an eye on that could surface? I, I know you said Harry Giles earlier in the pod. Uh, who, who should people keep on their radar if the Kings do decide to alter course at some point? Harry's probably the number one guy. I'm The other guy I would say is Scal, but with Scal the last guy on the depth chart in the front court, I'm not sure that they're going to put any kind of emphasis on getting him minutes, even if things were to go in that direction because they have Marvin Bagley Jr. and Harry Giles ahead of him. And they still, I think they're going to want to see what they have with Willie Cauley-Stein for the full season because it's going to come at the end of this year whether they give him a big extension. They're going to want to flesh that out completely, get as much information as they can before making that decision, which indicates to me they're going to want to give him a lot of minutes moving forward regardless of what happens. Harry would definitely be the number one guy. You you could say Frank Mason, but I, I, yeah, I mean, Frank Mason would be the other guy and playing point guard. I'm, I'm sure he could put up some numbers that, that might be good from a fantasy perspective, but it, it really is Harry. I'm sorry. It really is Harry Giles. Jaeger's done a, a pretty good job of implementing what he wants with the young players and getting, getting good results here. So, you know, it, it's hard to get on him and say, oh, well, we, I wish he would, I wish he had put more of an emphasis on developing these young players when we've we've got this incredible, insane record here, 30 games in that we had no idea was coming. <laughs> well, my buddy Chris, that's pretty much a tour de Sacramento Kings, I think. We hit on almost everybody. Did you uh, did you come out the other end okay on this one? I didn't hurt you too bad? Oh, man, it, w- it was so good to be the person not handling hosting duties. <laughs> Gosh, it is so much. Things go off the rails. It's the host's fault, not me. Can't blame me for anything. Nope. I'm just, I'm loaning my time because I love Dan Besbris. <laughs> Beyond that, nothing is my responsibility. He's right. This one's on me. He's Christian Villery. He's at my buddy Chris. He is the host of the Hoop Ball Sacramento Kings podcast and runs the at Hoopball Kings Twitter uh, account. So go follow that. Go follow Chris. Check him out. My man. Thanks as always. You got it, sir. <laughs> oh, Christian Villery. That was fun. He's one of our guys over here at the Hoob, at the Hoob HQ. He's actually literally one of the guys at Hoopball HQ. Christian works uh, out of the Hoopball offices. I don't know if you guys knew that. He's up there in Sacktown with Brew. Quick look here at the Thursday card, and it's a short one, so this won't take very long, and I won't get you wrapped up for your day. Uh, two games on Thursday. Ah, man, so boring. How upsetting, huh? 12 yesterday to 2 today. I'm so ah, I know I said it earlier in the show, but man, I really want those weeks back where it was just like seven games every day. Houston is in Miami. Can the Rockets keep it going? You know, the the positive sign from yesterday for Houston was that Chris Paul was good. That hasn't been the case, really, all season. And I bought low on Chris Paul in a couple of spots, and I've been generally disappointed. Obviously, the assists are still a really nice number. He's at 8.2 on the year. He still manages to rack up a boatload of assists, uh, without committing you know, four or five turnovers a game, but everything is down for Paul. With the exception, I guess, of steals. Steals are more in, you know, he's playing three more minutes this year, but they're up from last season. It's just everything is weird for him. Every metric is off from his career high, and I don't know if that meant he's been playing through injuries 
or if there's something else at play. And I know that he's getting a little bit older. I know he's 33, which as a 35-year-old man, I can say at 33, you do start to slow a tiny bit. But to to have, you know, a summer off and then to just not, to be totally different doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if it's the different personnel in Houston, if it's getting that last big contract. Maybe he didn't come into training camp in the right shape. Maybe the early season injury derailed him. Maybe the the fight with Rajon Rondo. Whatever it is, something is goofy. And Chris Paul has all of this crazy room to grow. He's number 25 in nine category leagues, despite how bad he's been in almost every category. The assists are basically in line with last year. The steals are basically in line with last year. Rebounds are down. Turnovers are up. Free throw percent is his lowest mark in a season since 2006. 12 years ago, and right now, by the way, if it doesn't change, it will be the lowest of his career. He's sitting on the lowest of his career. Although, uh, looking at his recent game log, I believe he's actually made his last eight in a row. So it's starting to creep back up where it should be. And that's a good sign for me. Making his free throws is telling me that maybe he's starting to feel a little bit better. Yesterday was the first game he's shot over 50% from the field in weeks. He went 7 of 9 against Sacramento on November 17th. That's a month ago, guys. He missed a couple of games in there, I realize that. He has two games since that day where he's shot 50% on the nose, but yesterday was the first time since November 17th that he's shot over 50% from the field. That's not the Chris Paul that we've come to know. He's a 47% career shooter. He's a 37% career shooter from downtown. In fact, he's not taking more three-pointers this year than last year. So that doesn't really explain it. He's just down. And so what the hope here is that maybe yesterday was a sign of things to come. Let's see if he can string a couple good ones in a row. Because uh, then you're looking at a guy who could jump from top 25 to top 10. I mean, this is a top 10 guy we're talking about in Chris Paul when he's right. On the Miami side, uh, Goran Dragic is out for two months, although to me it doesn't change things as much as everybody is insinuating. He's basically been out for the last month anyway, playing sparingly here and there. Uh, There's been a Tyler Johnson push, but I don't think that it's just going to all fall on him. I think you're going to see more Tyler Johnson, more Justice Winslow, more Kelly Olynyk, more Dwayne Wade. There's going to be a big splitting of goodies. And so let's keep a close watch on this game. I'm definitely using Kelly Olynyk because every time Miami loses a ball handler, his role at the four and the five becomes more solidified as a ball mover. Houston, by the way, favored by three in this game, and I don't want anything to do with it. Miami's coming back home off a long road trip. That's a down spot. Houston's running hot right now. Uh, If anything, for me, it would be the Rockets. But no. I mean, they traveled east. For a back-to-back, so they lose an hour? I don't I don't like this at all. This could be an ugly one, and both sides could be ugly. Dallas at the Clippers, on the other hand, this is a revenge spot for the Clippers. They played against Dallas, uh, I think, just a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Let me pull up the exact date on that bad boy. Uh, December 2, so 18 days ago, the Clippers lost in Dallas 114 to 110. It was a good ball game. DeAndre Jordan had his little versus the LA game. He played really well. Clippers have been bad lately, so you're getting a nice low line. But this is the first time that LA has had two days in the same city in a month and a half, and this is going to be as rested as they've been in a month and a half. So I like LA in this one. Revenge game, good spot. Uh homestand, Dallas mini slump a little bit. Clippers by three and a half. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll lean to the Clippers side on that one. And I doubt I'm alone, which is a little bit unfortunate, which means if we're going down, I guess we're all going down together. That'll do it, folks. Wrapping it up here on Fantasy NBA Today. Tomorrow, we'll finish up the week live with Aaron Bruski late morning Pacific time. We'll adjust the schedule. That should be a little bit easier, I think, for a lot of folks to uh, to tune in on that one. Thanks again to Christian Villery at my buddy Chris. I am Dan Vespers. Have a lovely Thursday. We'll talk to you tomorrow.
This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.